welcome everyone to Idea Me, uh, the show that profiles uh, humans behind the really big ideas that are shaping the world uh, and inspiring future creators. Uh, and for all those that love really big ideas and great stories, I'm Ira Pastor. I'm your aging and longevity ambassador for this journey. Uh, and so, you know, for the last few shows, we've been spending times at different well, hierarchical levels of the aging process, uh, talking a bit about the genome, the microbiome, the macrobiome. Um, and one theme that keeps coming back time and time again is that, you know, none of these processes that contribute to health, disease, aging, and so forth happen in a vacuum. Uh, you know, genes by themselves are wonderful, but they don't do anything outside of the context of gene regulatory networks and metabolic architectures of cells. Uh, cells are wonderful, but they're operating as part of larger physiological networks uh, that integrate all sorts of biophysical forces in the microenvironment. And this sort of overarching theme of, you know, in biological systems that are continually changing, uh, but maintaining themselves as part of a unified whole. Uh, continues at all levels of this hierarchy, even beyond the, the individual organism. Uh, we as an organism interact with our environment, friendships, technologies, social networks, ecosystems, uh, and they all impact our journey. Uh, so today's guest, uh, who's going to take us much further along uh, in this theme and others and, and their ultimate connection to human aging, uh, is Dr. Marios Kiriazis. Uh, Dr. Kiriazis is a medical doctor, uh, got his degree at the University of Rome in Italy, uh, spent time in clinical practice in Cyprus, the U.S., the U.K. Uh, he's a gerontologist and chartered member of the Royal Society of Biology, uh, postgraduate qualifications uh, from the Royal College of Physicians in London in geriatric medicine, um, is a member of the Board of Trustees at the Mediterranean Graduate School of Applied Social Cognition, uh, affiliate researcher and evolution complexity and cognition group at University of Brussels, nominated for the Nobel Prize in Medicine, uh, a truly uh, amazing background, and currently runs the uh, Elpis Foundation for Indefinite Lifespans, which is really um, a transdisciplinary approach to this problem of human aging and degeneration, merging all sorts of different disciplines, including biology, complexity science, evolution, cybernetics, the neurosciences. Um, author of literally hundreds of papers, dozens of books, and a, a wonderful synopsis page uh, called The Indispensable Soma. We'll put those links up on the pages. Um, with all of that, uh, Dr. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us on the show today. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Uh, so, you know, to start off, we usually give our guests the floor. Um, for those of us, you know, listening that do not know you, we'd love to hear about you, your background, you know, what got you interested in science, what got you interested in medicine, and ultimately how you ended up sort of at the epicenter of uh, thought leading in the area of aging and gerontology. Yes, okay. Uh, well, starting from my family, my uh, grandfather and great-grandfather were doctors. So it was decided when the time came that I should become a doctor as well. And I finished my medical degree. And I was thinking what specialty to, to take. And it seemed at the time, it was um, the late 80s, that the best speciality would be old age, starting from the illnesses of old age and moving into the biology of aging. Um, and from then on, I did a master's degree. It was the first master's degree in gerontology at the University of London. Um, and that covered all aspects of aging, um, financial as well as social, but I concentrated on the biological aspect. And I happen to have some very good tutors, uh, including um, Thomas Kirkwood, who was supervising me in my um, course, the final exam. And I had some wild ideas at the time. I told him, he said, sure, do them, uh, examine them. And the, the idea I had at the time is to include a, a, to a view of aging, which was comprehensive, not just concentrate on one thing, but concentrate on, zoom out from the current view. 
and from then on I passed through all the stages of um, age related interests starting with pills um, calorie restriction um, and then moved on to my current view which is more all-encompassing it's not I'm not only concentrating on one aspect of the aging process, but many different aspects as they interact together to form what we call aging. Uh, it's important to say that as a clinician, so working with patients, my interest is not to study worms or cells or molecules. My interest is to study how aging affects the individual human. I'm not that interested in animals either, although we get a lot of information from animals, from animal research. Uh, so I was thinking of how to define aging because uh, there are many definitions based on the interest of each person. Um, so my definition of aging from the clinical point of view is simply time-related dysfunction. So it's this dysfunction of the organism due to time, passage of time. Um, and this gives quite a clear idea of how to concentrate to stop this dysfunction. It's the dysfunction that matters, not, not anything else. Um, again, I'm not interested so much of how a cell is affected by aging. I'm interested in how a human that it becomes unable to do what they want to do due to the passage of time. Absolutely. Uh, so, yes. So, yeah, I mean, that, that's a, uh, a a very much appreciated perspective. I, uh, hang, having hung out in, in various trenches of the biomedical industry, I, I do understand the, the need, uh, you know, while we could focus on a variety of organisms, ultimately, uh, you know, we're interested in humans and no matter how many different species you can look at, um, the human is the human and yeah. we need to... And that's why I don't get very excited about research breakthroughs in mice or in worms. Maybe there, there is some relationship, but when it right. comes to humans, that research cannot always be translated effectively into humans in a way that it would be of practical use to us. Absolutely. Um, we learn things, we get general ideas, but when people say um, a new breakthrough makes a mouse live twice as long, okay, uh, that doesn't mean anything to me. Right. Right. Well, going, you know, going forward on that theme, so you have created an extremely, you know, from my perspective, an extremely elegant uh, model let's say, related to human aging, which uh, is known as the indispensable SOMA hypothesis, which basically, if I may paraphrase, um, posits that you know, humans that are appropriately integrated with their complexity, their complex technological information rich cognitive environments, and who simultaneously make themselves indispensable uh, for the adaptability changing of that environment, which is called the law of requisite usefulness, uh, it may experience this reversal of uh, priorities in terms of allocation of resources from germline reproduction to somatic repair and thus reduction of age-related disease and generation. Um, ultimately, the core rationale as it relates to humans, you know, it, if we're more valuable in the sort of the evolution of the society, the ecosystem around us, it's much more likely for us to, to live and function for much longer. Can you take us deeper into this topic? Uh, and you know, once again, I was just paraphrasing, but uh, a little deeper into it, and then also uh, your ideas as far as various biologic mechanisms that come into play, uh, whether they're epigenetic, metabolic signaling, transfer, redistribution of resources, and so forth, because this is truly a very elegant part of your integrated yeah. theme. Yeah, of course, you put it very eloquently. That's, that's what uh, the theory is about, the hypothesis. And it's difficult to explain because it has sep different separate areas which need to be explained, and then altogether, 
to be considered as a general uh, un, un, unified uh, aspect. For example, um, the, the thing you said about being a useful, a useful agent within a society is taken from the field of cybernetics. In cybernetics, there are studies that show that uh, an agent, an agent is something that acts. Um, anything, it could be a computer node, a neuron, an individual, anything that acts within a wider system mm -hmm. is an agent. So if that agent um, helps the whole survive and adapt, then there are different mechanisms which we either know or we don't know, that make it live longer within that um, environment or last for longer. Um, so to, to give you an example, some, um, a simple example taken from computer links, a link that is being used by many people, um, remains and adapts and changes. A link that doesn't get used at all, eventually it will come a time that it will perish. Mm -hmm. um, the same with other, th other things, information on the internet. If you use it a lot, it, it will stay around, go around the, the re all the internet, the cloud and so on, and remain there, adapt, change, and evolve. If it's not being used, then that's a natural law, it will, it will uh, perish. So I took that thinking and I thought if, if humans as, as natural beings obey basic nature laws, then this should be true in field of aging. So if we make ourselves helpful in some way in promoting the evolvability of the human race, and pushing the human race to evolve and develop, then there should be some mechanisms which, again, we may know or may not know, mm -hmm. or I'm not even interested of how they work, I'm interested that they exist, and they will make us stay longer within this uh, human environment. And then I started thinking, what could be these mechanisms? Uh, maybe I'm wrong in, in one aspect of my thinking, but it doesn't really matter. What matters is that if, if we help the evolvability of, of the entire human race, we uh, will stay around for longer. And thinking about the disposable soma theory, mm -hmm. disposable soma theory says, basically what it says is that all resources, energy resources have a preference for the repair of the germline so that we continue the propagation of the species. And there are no enough resources for the soma, for the body, to repair itself with the passage of time. Therefore, if we age and die. The, um, again, just to say something about here, what I say to lay people to make them understand sure. what aging is. In, uh, in, in a bit more biological way. Aging is the damage that we have, we have and the inability to repair this damage. It doesn't matter if we have damage. What matters is the inability to repair this damage. And the inability to repair this damage is due to lack of resources which are preferentially being taken away from the soma and given to the germline. In this way, humans I'm talking about humans, live longer through their, through their offspring and the body, the individual body, ages and dies. But then this, then I go in another area and thinking why does this happen in nature? Things in nature don't happen just because that's how it is. They, they have some underlying reason. And the reason is that um, uh, Again, going out of the discussion here, um, life, nature promotes life. Okay, the general propensity of nature is towards life, living. If you cut the grass at home, you cut your grass, 
after a few days or weeks, it grows. Mm. Why does it grow? Think about it. You don't say, okay, the grass is growing. It grows not because there are little green men and push it up. <laughs> it grows because there are forces in nature. Let's not talk about these forces that make it um, live as long as it is possible. You cut a branch of a tree, it regrows. Um, you take another example that I use, which may be relevant, is if you, if you take a stone and you go in front of a cat or a dog and you throw, or you pretend you throw the stone, the dog will run away. <laughs> if you do that in America, the dog will run away. If you do it in <laughs> India, you still run away. How do they know to run away? It's not that, it's an instinct that says there is danger here. I want to go away and live another day. It's, it's a basic instinct in mm -hmm. all living things. Therefore, coming back, if there is this uh, force, power, or force of the field, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. promotes life and wants us to stay alive, why do we die? We die because um, there is more danger of us dying from accidents and diseases. Therefore, nature, let's say, sat down one day and decided instead of putting all my energy into the individual body, I'll put my energy onto the germ line, repair the germ DNA, transmit it. We have another human being start from afresh. Mm -hmm. I don't care if the old human being dies, we have another one, and life continues. However, we are coming now to a point which this may not entirely be true because we have technology, we have not technology only in uh, medical terms to help us cure diseases, mm -hmm. have digital technology, communication technology, which makes us um, somewhat useful within this environment of technology. So, say you, you are quite active in your field, you know a, a lot of information, you are a valuable member of the human race, if you age and die, there come a point which would be um, disadvantage, disadvantages to nature to kill you. It would be better for nature to keep you and continue your, all your knowledge and your experience of giving to the human race so mm. that we can evolve better. Um, uh, therefore, the way we act within this society, society if we act in a way to, um, I'll stop again here and go into another bit, to improve our cognitive function, because what we do now is to our brain, uh, through our cognition. Mm -hmm. We don't offer anything to the human race by digging the land or being strong and having big muscles. We offer because our brain is, uh, quite effective at, at dealing with the complexities of the current life that we have, which is the life of technology. Technology means brain, it doesn't mean muscle. Therefore, the brain, the, in other words, the, the neurons, uh, and I started from here in deeper uh, research, the neurons try to stay alive as much as they can and fight between the germ, left, germ cells, which mm -hmm. they try to stay alive for as long as they can. And if you see the research, you'll see that there is quite a lot of uh, antagonism between the two. Um, neurons create substances which go and destroy because of the process of the germ cells. Mm -hmm. The germ, germ line retaliates by producing counter measures which go and destroy the neurons and so I, I got the idea that this balance at the moment is in favor of the germ cells but with the development of society and technology and us using our brain more mm -hmm. we change uh, the neurons get stronger they produce say biological substances, substances which downgrade the importance of the germline and therefore if the brain cells stay alive they stay alive 
Uh, it is a an extremely uh, elegant uh, and integrated model that I feel truly takes into account everything that we are learning nowadays regarding, as you said, the these systems are not in isolation. Uh, peripheral nervous system and the endocrine system, the lymph system and the central nervous system. And we unfortunately too often don't appreciate that degree of integration. So I, you know, I, I really appreciate uh, you know, what you've outlined um, in this model uh, extremely. From there, I try to involve other aspects of science. For example, for me, for me, this is a low dose phenomenon where a low dose can cause activation in something and a higher dose can cause damage. Let me, uh, I, I, I've got to, it was funny because that's, that's in my next question. So let me just preface that because, um, you know, you, I've written, you know, in, in several of your papers, you know, clearly you are a, a staunch believer that, you know, as good as sort of traditional pharmaceutical, pharmacological approaches, damage-centric biotechnology and so forth may get one day. Uh, alone, they are sort of insufficient to, to take care of this problem that we call aging. Um, I, 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 I very much agree with this. And, you know, one of the, you know, as we discuss sort of the various sort of physiological dynamics that make up aging and people are very interested in sort of biologic fitness, uh, which, you know, sort of the core of a damage centric hypothesis. Uh, but one, you know, there's many other themes that, you know, people overlook and really, I, you know, I talk about the, sometimes they scratch their head and they just don't understand what you're talking about. And, you know, one of these that uh, I routinely see is the principle of robustness, sort of this concept that, you know, uh, a system, how a system maintains itself, mm -hmm via all sorts of external and internal perturbations. Can you take a little bit of you know, time to explain the concept further of robustness and then, I said you were linking in hormesis, how, you know, it's not gonna be uh, a pharmaceutical entity per se that you know, repairs something, but when we talk about robustness and the ability to, to keep our 80 or 90 year old system <laughs> you know, against perturbations, uh, whether these are mild stresses like exercise or whether they're more um, substantial things, heat shock, radiation, hypergravity, you know, there's a variety of things in the hormesis basket. But if you can dive a little deeper into that, I think people really need to understand that principle that it's separate from biologic fitness. Um, yes, hormesis uh, is, as I said, you can take a poison, a small amount of poison, you take it and it may be doing you good. Take a bit more, it will do you bad. That same principle is true for any other thing that you do, exercise. When we do physical exercise, it's an example of physical hormesis. Mm -hmm. Stress the muscles and the muscles get slightly damaged. Therefore, they try to repair the damage and they become stronger. Uh, the same is with nutrition, calorie restriction. It's uh, nutritional for me, is we put the organism under certain stress, we activate the stress response, and the stress response repair the small damage we are doing. And we just re recently wrote a book with uh, Suresh Ratkan, which is quite one of the fathers of hormesis in clinical mm -hmm. biological areas. Uh, and we explored all sorts of other causes of hormesis, not just uh, hypergravity or um, heat or cold, but other radiation. You could have pharmaceutical hormesis, um, nutrients, herbs. Mm -hmm. And my aspect was technological st uh, stress of the brain. In other words, stressing the brain through uh, video games or other complex ways that stimulate the brain and cause the um, neuro neuronal stress response. So when the neuron is stunned due to too much information, up to a point, not a lot, up to a point, mm -hmm. then the stress response creates factors that repair this damage. And uh, from what I was saying earlier, some of these uh, stress factors 
go and attack the germline. This is quite important. So the more we exercise our brain, mm -hmm. the more damage is done to our germline. We can see that in our societies. It's, it's quite complex, of course, but in our societies, as we become more complex as societies, fertility declines. Mm. Isn't it true? It's there. It's not my theory or right. uh, uh, hypothesis. All civilized Western countries um, have uh, reducing um, fertility. And one in three couples in Germany decide not to have children for whatever reason. I don't care. If we don't have children, if fertility declines, mm -hmm. how are we going to live longer? How, how is us humans going to live longer and continue living? We are going to live longer through us living longer, not through our children. So that ties in with what we were saying earlier. Um, but the hor basic the hormetic event makes us stronger, more robust, and we are in a position to deal with any external uh, factors that may cause us damage. We maintain a certain dynamical stage. Mm -hmm which um, can respond to higher stress perhaps later on. Um, <clears throat> so that's why I moved away a bit from the physical um, aspects and physical exercises and I promote mental uh, cognitive exercises, brain exercises, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to help people to use their brain more as a form of uh, neural hormesis to cause slight damage, not a lot, slight damage mm -hmm. to neurons and it activates different biological processes. Many people ask me, how would I know that um, the, the stress that I'm causing to my brain is beneficial or detrimental? And we did some research and my opinion is to say that you should stress your brain in a way that makes you um, slightly uncomfortable. Okay. Um, not a lot, just slightly uncomfortable. If you think that the pressure is getting too much, then you stop. Um, but on the other hand, not even, not just continue the activity and you don't find any interest in it and it doesn't cause slight uncomfortable. To, to get out of your comfort zone, but just mm -hmm. at the comfortable so not go wildly out and you get lost and then you get stressed and you have uh, all sorts of other problems so if, if you do an activity that makes you slightly uncomfortable then you're all right that's, that's a hormetic level of cognitive stress it's fascinating it makes the brain stronger therefore makes you stronger as well based on the previous the concepts that we discussed you know, it makes perfect sense. And it's, uh, yeah, you know, I thought about it as much as other physical forms of hormesis, but it makes complete sense that, you know, as important as yeah. an organ as it is, that uh, it needs to be integrated into the, the bigger so, thing. Other things that I'm advising to people in order to be useful agents within our environment is mm -hmm. to go out digitally maintain a presence on social media, useful presence, positive presence, presence, not just put your card or that you're drinking coffee. I don't care. <laughs> but if you share an idea that I find stimulating, uh -huh. it, use it, understand it, modify it, and then maybe transmit it to somebody else. And in this way, our brain gets upgraded each time. So have a good presence digitally, use um, online video games, quality video games that exercise other aspects of dexterity, vision, hearing, and so on. Then try to be an agent that, um, in a way that nature will find it difficult to eliminate you. Because if it eliminates you, it will cause more damage to the whole than uh, not eliminating you. Yes. It's less general ideas to be discussed and be thought about. Yeah, it's uh, it's, it's fascinating, and it's it's uh, as I said, it's it's so elegant a, a perspective. I you know, I, I really, 
I really appreciate the uh, I really appreciate the concepts. Um, the uh, you know one other sort of segment of your work that I, I want to touch on, um, which feeds into this, uh, are, are the the themes of uh, complexity uh, and randomness, uh, because you know, you know, I, I come out of the the sort of the traditional pharmaceutical industry, and you know, we are while everything you know that. Well, I'm not an expert in cybernetic theory, but uh, you know, Ashby's law of requisite variety, you know, telling you that look, if you want to control a system, you better be able to control many states of that system and not. Yeah. Small amounts of it. Uh, simultaneously, everywhere around us in nature, you, you, I, I always give the example: the tree outside my window here. You know, when it gets sick, it, it doesn't take 500 milligrams of amoxicillin every day for 10 days. It creates, you know, combinatorial random mixtures of phytochemicals to deal with its invading fungus or virus or what have you. Yet, paradoxically. Uh, we're at a time in 2019 where our pharmaceutical industry is moving in the entire opposite direction. You know, they want you to take that 10 milligrams of drug X every day for the rest of your life. Uh, those studies will show that, you know, there are points that, uh, you know, it might be good instead of taking 10 milligrams to take five, uh, have your body adjust. Uh, you know, we are a, a constantly adjusting, uh, changing uh, organism and we need to embrace not just standardization and you know, but complexity, randomness in our daily life. Um, can you speak a little bit to that in you know ways that sort of those concepts integrate into the bigger model that you propose? Well, I was trained as a traditional conventional doctor, and I used to be told that you you need to use a certain drug three times a day at this dose. But then over my many years of my career, I saw people who said, oh, I took this drug for three days, I was all right, and the fourth day I wasn't all right. It's the same drug, I haven't changed anything. What am I doing wrong? And I came to realize that we, we are not stable, stable organisms, we change. One day we may need to have more of something, another day less, or we may, become immune, let's say, to a particular drug or remedy. Um, and I don't know if there is a way of dealing with that because clinically to say to somebody, take it three times a day, but if you don't feel very well, or you, you, you have to have a way of measuring it. Mm -hmm. And this is where personalized medicine comes in. Personalized medicine tries to treat a patient as an, as an individual, not only once, but through time. Because you today may, be, um, may have these needs, tomorrow may, you may have different needs. And therefore the medication that you may be taking may not always be appropriate. Um, I see people who take, say, blood pressure tablets, and they are stable. And one day, without changing anything, their blood pressure goes very, very high. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when you examine it, I, I had a patient the other day who was stable, and then they called me and they said, my blood pressure is twice as high. The reason, she had olives with salt. She had olives with a lot of salt, and the salt caused a rise in the blood pressure. The next day, she didn't have the olives, therefore it was all right. That's, that's a small example. Mm -hmm. that we are not always the same. It depends what we eat, how we behave in one day. We are tired, we have a level of our hydration. We are complex beings. And this idea to do the same things regularly um, at the same dose, I can't recommend not to do it because I'm a clinical doctor. Right. Or people will say, ah, you see, Dr. Kiriaz has said not to take my pills and then I'll be in trouble. But my view is that we need to personalize it more to the needs of the individual. And from, then on, from there on, I go to the matter of regularity. 
And I advise people not to do regular things. If you do regular things, you eat the same time, same amount of food. Uh, that's not natural because we, we are not made to be regular. We are made to one day eat, another day don't eat. That's how it used to be in the old times, 10,000 years ago. We ate when there was food. And maybe that's why intermittent fasting and calorie restriction work because it's more in tune to our biology. Mm -hmm. So their regularity, I say, causes, not causes, worsens the aging process. Avoid regularity, do things in a more complex way, more unpredictable way, change uh, your routine. Don't always follow the same thing. And that's the same with the medication. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So moving from the science and theories. Um, I want to take a, a slight turn uh, and go into a little bit of the future. Um, you might call this science fiction or fantasy or whatever, but um, I pose this question sometimes that, you know, if if the sky opened up and an and unlimited amount of funding was dropped at your door, um, I, I usually pose the scenario, you know, if, if, the, if the CEO of Pfizer or Johnson & Johnson, whoever decided, you know, I'm going to dedicate my five, six, seven billion dollar R&D budget for the next 20 years to your concepts. Um, create the Mario's Curiasis aging, anti-aging vision of the future. What does the world look like in 20 years? If you um, take it. Yeah, funding for sure will help. And I have many projects that are waiting for funding and they are quite good projects. But I think it will happen anyway. If we leave it free, we leave society free, it will happen because one thing brings another. Uh, technology brings more technology. Um, that improves our lives. We think in a different way. Um, we get to learn new ideas which mm -hmm. spread very quickly. Um, so the funding wouldn't be for a particular item, a particular drug, but it would be for the process. I would like, for example, to take, I don't know, a thousand people who use um, computers in a positive way, mm -hmm. online video games, quality online video games, and a thousand people who don't, who just live in the fields and don't have too much contact with technology, and study their telomeres. You see, if their telomeres are longer with the technology group or not. If it is longer, that's one indication that this point of view is correct. Um, so that's where the funding would go. But if I didn't have the funds, then I would just leave matters and 10, 20, 30 years. The ideas would spread anyway. That's, that's my view, that's my hope. Excellent. Excellent. And, you know, now for the, uh, the wrap up question, which is clearly in the realm of science fiction, but um, the show usually poses the question about uh, who you, anywhere in the, in, in the history of this world, uh, may have wanted to meet uh, and talk to. Uh, if you had the ability to go in a time machine and travel anywhere, uh, what's your fantasy? Who would you want to meet and what do you want to talk to them about? I thought about this many times since I was a child, I've been thinking. And my answer is more or less always the same. I would like to go back 100 years ago and meet my grandfather. Um, he was a doctor, not a scientist, but a doctor. Um, I don't. I don't feel I would have anything useful to discuss with other personalities. Newton, for example, or Einstein. We know everything about them. They told us their theories. We told them. Sure. So I wouldn't have much to say. But my grandfather is more a personal thing for me because he was uh, able to inspire me to open my mind and see things in different ways. I haven't met him. He died. Two or three months after I was born, yeah. and also 
uh, 100 years ago is a period that interests me historically to see how the world was then. It was starting to wake up in the, before the technological revolution, what ideas were at the time. So I would meet my grandfather as a person and also meet members of that society to get interesting ideas and maybe learn something that we don't know as yet. Wonderful, wonderful. I, I, I love that answer. I would, I would do the exact same thing. Yeah. It's so, more than uh, Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. So, um, you know, we're coming to the point uh, of wrapping up. I, I really appreciate you devoting your time. Um, as mentioned, we will have the link to the uh, indisposable soma.info site. Uh, the Elpis Foundation, links to your papers, your books. Um, but once again, just going to give you the floor if there's anything that you want to pitch or wrap up with. Um, love to hear your, any final statements. Please have the floor. The thing I would like to say is that we have to move away from existing uh, worldviews and start thinking in different ways. The existing uh, point of views in aging in my view, haven't led anywhere as yet. So start using it in a different way, think along different lines. And if anybody is interested in going to my website on dispensablesoma.info, uh, we'll, they'll get some of my papers and ideas. There are some more scientific grounding in some areas. And I would love to have somebody to try to oppose my hypothesis. Uh, I haven't found anybody who was able up to the moment. People say a few things, but I have the answers ready, which strengthen my point of view. So if anybody's interested in counteracting some of my views, uh, I would be very, very pleased. Well, uh, hopefully this, this show will help get the message out further and, uh, and continue that dialogue and uh, discussion because there it's a very important set of concepts for the world to understand um, in my view so once again thank you marios for being here i really appreciate your time uh and i look forward to, to continuing following your work thanks so much thank you very much